Hi there, and welcome to the third episode of Expat Chat. James, I think it's pretty safe to say that we've been pretty blown away with the feedback, and we were originally planning on doing these twice a month, yeah. and this is our third one in three weeks. Yeah, so, exactly uh, right. but, you know, the, the, the feedback's been coming through thick and fast, so thank you very much for you know, all the questions and queries that everyone's had, and also just the, the nods to us that's been, uh, you know, keep it up, so yeah. it gives us the... Uh, the, the motivation to oh, keep going again. So just a couple of housekeeping issues mm-hmm. for those on the podcast. Uh, sincerely appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel, give us a rating, and also to write some reviews. You know, those reviews not only help us do a better job, but it also helps other expats find the uh, find the podcast. So that's a great thing. For those watching on, on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button uh, and also give us some commentary in the, in the comments. Because once again, uh, it's that sort of feedback. We know what direction to take this in, and all we want to do at the end of the day is provide value to expats. So uh, that's right. Yeah, you know, it's a big thing for us. So um, thank you once again, and uh, let's get the show on the road. So well, Brett, before we jump into yes. it, we should have a disclaimer. Yes. So obviously, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, do not take this as personal advice. It's general advice only. We're not actually providing advice to your specific situation. Um, obviously, seek obviously a professional advice from an individual that is actually qualified, whether it be qualified tax accountant or a qualified financial planner. Yep, definitely. Um, so not personal advice. Yep, fantastic. Um, happy International Women's Day. Today's a pretty auspicious day for half the population out there, which is fantastic. So yeah, that's right. certainly as a father of two daughters and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's great to see a lot of the things. You know, we decided to look at the data that we grabbed from the Expat Insights survey last year and... Uh, come up with some pretty interesting facts actually. So just to run through some of those, um, you know, over 60% of uh, Australian expat females are actually holding a bachelor or a postgraduate degree. So they're smart cookies, which is, which mm. is fantastic. Um, motivation for going overseas appears that uh, the adventure streak runs just as strongly with females and males, yes. with um, 24% of Australian women moving overseas to find a new challenge, which is great. So. Um, the world is a big place and uh, we always encourage people to go out there and experience it and um, certainly looks like uh, the ladies are taking that on board. Um, the next two most popular ones were um, certainly the issue of inter- inter-citizen um, marriages. Mm. So uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, responses there, uh, 19% of people moving overseas because they had a foreign citizen as a, uh, as a spouse or partner. And the last one was 16% uh, of uh, Australian women moved overseas because their partner accepted a role. Yeah. So um, relocating the whole family. Relocating the whole family exactly. So picking up the whole lot and uh, and moving them across. So um, it's always interesting to find out the the method or the motivations behind the screens anyway. Absolutely. Um, destination wise, this probably didn't come as as a surprise. No. The top two countries were the United States at 26% and the United Kingdom at 16.47%. And uh, followed after that were Canada, France, and the United Arab Emirates. France actually surprised me there. Well, I guess there's a lot of Francophiles in the uh, the, yeah. the Australian expat community, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, I think also too, you know, the French when you look at their main sectors of work, um, there is a lot of uh, of those areas that you know do correlate well with um, the roles that Australian women are working in Australia yeah. too. Yeah. So. If we go through and look at the employment side, mm. um, I think the actual the three most popular um, sectors were education at 22%, and then followed that by the healthcare sector at 12, and then the hospitality hospitality sector at 9%. Mm. So, you know, when you think of France, you know, all of those sort of sectors do correlate quite well, yeah. and uh, we've probably got a bit of that as well. Um, it would actually be interesting to go and one time when we've got a bit of spare time to actually delve in deeper and, and see what specific sectors you know Australian expert women are actually working yeah, yeah. at yeah. in the United States in the UK in Canada and it'd be also it'd be great to forecast the growth in those sectors of women as well yeah as they slowly take over the world definitely so it'd be very interesting to see obviously yeah the percentage changes year to year yep and I think we're, we're going to grab some great data this year yeah after the 2019 uh, insights survey is actually wrapped up no well, that's that's the whole point of doing these surveys every year so we can track the movements and see where what countries are becoming more popular, what countries are becoming less popular, uh, more males than females moving to specific countries, uh, jobs, you know, the whole gamut of information. And the mm-hmm. great thing about, and I want to say thank you very much to everyone out there for participating, for those who have. Uh, if you haven't participated in the uh, this year's survey yet, 
Uh, we're going to leave a link in the description uh, on YouTube and also in the show notes for, for the podcast yep. of where you can go. Um, right now, I haven't told James this yet, we're almost going through 1,670 oh, wow. responses okay. from yeah. 81 countries. Um, so 81. 81, yeah. So it's pretty crazy. We had yeah. two from Iraq last week, which is yeah. pretty cool. So yeah. we haven't had anyone from Iraq yet. So yeah. uh, uh, for those in Iraq, thank you very much. And uh, the interesting part is, Last year, when we ran the survey, we got 1,774 responses mm. over the whole survey. Yeah. Um, what are we, two and a bit months? Oh, yeah, two, uh, one month and a bit in. Yeah. Um, and, we're, and we're about to go through um, the numbers we exceeded last year. So, Which is amazing. It's amazing. And, and it's, it just goes to show, you know, that, uh, I mean, we would love to offer prizes. We would love to offer incentives to, to complete these surveys. But unfortunately... Um, the rules and regulations state that we'd have to actually register um, as a lottery or as a prize Something in 81 like countries. Yeah. And um, while we do financial planning for expats very well when it comes to the navigating the government corridors, yeah, um, we'll leave that to someone else. So yeah. all we're doing is appealing to, I guess, that Aussie mateship, mm. you know, help an expat out because those who do benefit from the survey are not only those who are about to move overseas and want a more of an idea like a coalface type of opinion of what it's like in that country. Yes. But also, too, for other expats who are already overseas moving to a different country. Yeah, that's right. So, exactly. um, you know, the, the data helps us when it comes to lobbying Canberra. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a grossly incorrect assumption of, of who an expat is. They, yeah. I think they think them all as high-flying executives on, on seven-figure salaries. No, but um, it's just a common Australian... Aussie, no, exactly. You know, I mean, well, well, the fact that an example of that is... Some of the figures you just wrote off then about the stats about how there's such a large proportion of uh, females mm-hmm. in the education industry. So yep. these are just teachers, international yep. schools. Yeah, you know, n- nothing out of the ordinary. Teachers, nurses, working in hotels. You yep. know, no different to Sydney versus Shanghai. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. And that's that's the you know I think that what we see and we hear from our clients is the angst that they go through. Mm. Like you know they read in the press the government's opinion on what an expat is. Mm. But it probably only applies to one yeah. percent of the expat community. Yeah, yeah. much like the population. Being one percenters. Yeah, exactly. It is. Right. Yeah. It is. So you know, certainly the data from the surveys does help us trying to right those wrongs with Canberra's opinion. Mm. So please definitely uh, continue to um, you know provide feedback because it's all that information. We're not making it up. You know, we have the data at hand. We can go to the you know go to Canberra and say, guys. You know, you want to do this, this is who it's going to affect. Mm, exactly. It's not going to affect who you think it's going to affect. And, and certainly, um, we've been using last year's data to try to um, convince Canberra not to go ahead with the main residence exemption changes because mm. they're not going to affect the big end of town. Yeah. They're going to affect, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So, yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, uh, just on that, I think they think by introducing this piece of legislation, it's going to have expats running to the market to sell. Mm. They introduce this. If anything, it's going to discourage. It's going to discourage them to sell. That's right. They'll likely hold on to it until they come back to Australia, where yep. it's likely that the old rules will still apply to them. But obviously, if they've rented out past the six years, you know, we know CGT will start attracting. So, it's not going to have the impact that they want it to have at all. And look, judging by that commentary we saw from the Treasury officials the other day, yes, um, you know, when very plain questions were asked of them, and they said, "Oh, that's an ATO question." Yeah. They didn't even know what the ramifications were. They didn't even know how to answer it, yeah. which is ridiculous. I mean, doesn't doesn't politics. give any confidence at all. I know, exactly. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. um, But anyway, I'll, let's let's jump in. Yeah, Today, definitely. Today's agenda, um, a few things. So I'm um, going to touch base on common reporting standards. Yep. Um, deemed disposal. I've had a few inquiries the last few weeks, and I want to, uh, I suppose, go through and brush up on it, just let everyone know what it is. Because... Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't know what it is, you can use it and it can save you thousands in tax, as we know. Um, non residency but around self-managed super fund, and just what to be aware of there. Um, briefly touch base on the opposition's announcements of what they want to abolish and get rid of. Yep. Um, and then lastly, Q&A. Q&A, so, yep. Now we've got a lot of questions, so looking forward to running those through. And once again, if you do have questions, there's a lot of avenues you can ask them. Um, head to our Facebook page, Atlas Wealth Management, um, certainly hit us message up on there through Twitter. You can use the, either use the hashtag expat chat or ask Atlas, ask Atlas. Yep. Um, or just drop us an email at info at atlaswealth.com.au and, uh, and more than happy to um, yeah bring them up on the on the channel and uh, discuss them at length. So that's why we're here. Yep. So Brett, what is common reporting standards? Give me a rundown. 
the common reporting standard is essentially a unilateral um, effort by governments around the world to share data. Yeah. Okay. So in the past, we've always heard of the tax havens like British Virgin Islands, Panama. We all know what happened with Panama. Yep. Um, you know, all these nice little Switzerlands, you know, those are the historical one. Um, and essentially what it is, is a data sharing agreement mm-hmm. amongst over 100 countries and territories. Okay. Yep. So what it means is if you're an expat based in, say, UK or Denmark, mm-hmm. then when the local, say, we'll talk about UK, mm-hmm. when the HMRC finds out you're an Australian expat, yes. they will ask your banks and your financial institutions to provide your t- Australian tax file number. Yeah, okay. We know internationally it's called yep. a TIN, yep. a tax, identifi- tax identification number. Yep. And essentially the way it works is these guys will then take that information and pass it straight to the ATO. Yep. So if you've got money hiding anywhere in these 100 signatory countries, mm. um, the ATO will know about it. Yeah. And years gone by, an expat could hide overseas. Yeah, of course. The information, the technology, the agreements weren't there. Well, data, yeah, the data sharing wasn't even there. The, even the data feeds, the, the tech wasn't there. The tech wasn't there. That, yeah. That's right. There's no, no function to, to share. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's amazing you know, how interrelated the government's um, connectivity is, not only yep. domestically, but also internationally. I mean, yep. I got a letter the other day um, which proved the point. So I moved house, as you know, yep. a couple of months ago, and I got a letter from the Australian Electoral Commission oh, wow. to say that a government agency had notified them of a change of address. Just want to make sure you're going to vote, Brad. <laughs> well, and uh, all I did was I changed the address of my driver's license. That's all I've got around to doing it. Yeah, yeah. But just goes to show that the internally yep. everyone's talking. Yeah. Same as occurring internationally, and, and a lot of the you know those people listening and viewing, um, you may have got notifications either online or in letter form or from the banks, banks. Yeah, banks asking are where you're domiciled and and. Once they've got that, what it means is you'll say, I'm domiciled in the UK. Mm. Then that bank flags that and then knows to pass that to the HMRC. Yeah. yeah. So the world is becoming a very small place for expats. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I think a lot of people get scared about data sharing and like, okay, well, if they know about it, does that mean they want to tax me? I mean, it's it's mainly about reporting. It's just it making is. sure that uh, they know you have it and that's it. it I mean... We know with the IRS, you, it's not necessarily about the tax side. Mm. It's mainly about the reporting side. If you don't report it, you actually get fined. And yeah. that's what actually yeah. uh, scares you know the crap out of people. Yep. So well, this, this is actually the funny thing, because the only major country that hasn't signed up to FATCA, uh, sorry, signed up to the Common Reporting Standard, yeah, yeah. is the United States. Do as I say. So you've heard it from here. <laughs> if you want to hide money anywhere around the world, hide it in the US. Give US. it to Donald. <laughs> He'll look after it for you, trust me. That's bizarre. But one, one thing you just mentioned there, FATCA. So does that interlink with CRS? Or? So FATCA is the reverse to, to the CRS. Okay. So the CRS means that um, by law, all these countries have to share data yep. in the signatory countries. Okay. Yep. FATCA is an agreement that the US has with individual countries yep. that they must share information back to the US. Yeah, okay. So it's a great case of do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, okay. Um, as part of that FATCA agreement, the US can share data with the Australian authorities. Mm-hmm but they don't have to. And reading between the lines, when you go through and look at the legislation, I don't, don't encourage anyone to look at it. Yep. Virtually what it says is, if there's criminal proceedings and those sort of things, we will share it. Yeah. But apart from that, no. No chance. No chance. Oh, so okay. there's actually been a massive repatriation of capital back into the US, so it's quite smart by them. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to hide money in the world, just buy something in the US. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, Very unusual. just a big warning because the ATO will know more about you mm. and we'll talk about the Hex and Help Debt situation because this is where it's going to really tie into that. So, yeah. you know, because they're virtually going to know, you say I earned X and your local um, tax agency in the country you live in says yep. you earn Y, yep. um, the ATO can come back to you and say, hey, no, you're we wrong. We know this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good segue. I didn't actually put it on today's agenda, but HEX. Yep. So HEX repayments when you're a non-resident. Yep. We know that they're compulsory now. and Still meeting people who don't know anything about it. I was talking to uh, talking to a lady in Bahrain Ooh. three days ago. Okay, yep. And sort of knew something about it. Yep. Um, but didn't have a clue. So just to run through to the viewers and the listeners, yep. uh, one, 1 July, you have to report your overseas uh, global... Uh, gross income mm-hmm. to the ATO. Yep. Do that two ways. You can either do it through an accountant or mm-hmm. through the my.gov 
www.ngbrand.com.au website. Yep. Um, the problem is, is A, most don't know about it. No. no. And B, there's a lot of confusion as to what you have to disclose. So quickly running through it, you know, the threshold is about 54,136, yeah, well, but it's about the change. Changed. It's yeah. dropping down to 45 now. Yes. I think if you're over 45, or if you're in that first tier, 45 and... Um, it's one percent of your income. Yeah, and then yeah. above fifty four, it's four percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is people assume that a they earn below that, and then they work out if, especially if they're earning US dollars, the US Australian dollars fallen a lot. Yes. So suddenly they're getting bumped up into the first category. The or, first category. Yeah. And when you do the declaration, you have to go off a standardised average on the ATR website that actually says. You can't pick the best exchange rate at the time. Oh, okay. You have to actually take our exchange rate, which is a combination of 12 months worth of exchange yes. rates, no, and I'll okay. average it out. Okay. So people are saying, oh, I'm fine, because they worked it out on the back of a, uh, a cornflakes packet yes. um, when the exchange rate was good. <laughs> but it's yeah. now the exchange rate bad, is bad from an Australian point of view, so yeah. that could push them up. Yep. Even if you weren't above the threshold, mm -hmm. You still have to report. Yep. And you know, I think it's called a non-disclosure report. I can't remember the exact verbiage, and I'll put a link to an article we wrote in the show notes and also in the description below. Um, with those notes, uh, sorry, with that declaration, there's virtually two declarations you have to make underneath the the threshold. The yep. first one is saying, "Look, I earn. I think it's about fourteen thousand um, dollars. You know, I'm good." Yeah, yeah. The other one says, "I am between fourteen and the lower threshold." Yeah. Um, I'm still okay, but I'm just letting you know this. Yeah, okay. And then the other one's above that again. So, yeah. you know, I know a lot, met a lot of people who haven't actually made any declarations no. regardless of that. So no. um, certainly talking to people, you know, over the last couple of weeks saying, look, this is coming up. And they're yeah, like, well, what's a coming up? A ATO is going to start clamping down on this because ATO wants to get paid back its money. Um, yep. It's it, If they don't, if you don't disclose and they're happy to fine you $500, mm -hmm. um, they've got no issue with fining. So yeah, obviously get your disclosures in, but... Just on talking about declaring the worldwide income, um, you know, if you're going through an accountant, the accountant can use three, three methods. So there's obviously the simple method where you yep. just like, this is my income, this is my proof of it, they'll go and lodge it. Um, if you don't really have any deductions, then they can use, um, I suppose, a standardized uh, method where based on your industry, your job role, they can apply a standard worldwide deduction to your income to bring okay. it down a tiny bit. Yep. And then the next method is the complex and comprehensive method where if you've got, say, a, a property that's needed to give back in Australia, they'll just essentially compensate everything yep. like they're lodging a tax return. Yep. And then based on that net income amount, that's obviously, you know, gotcha. will fall into the tier. So there's three methods you can use. I mean, if you've got bits and pieces, it's obviously more beneficial to go the complex method if you've got yeah. some, you know, relevant deductions. But, um, yeah, start lodging because otherwise you're just going to get fined. Yep. And, and that's where it's... I remember reading an article that the ATO was pointing out that a non-disclosure can cost you up to 75% penalties mm. of the amount of tax owed. Oh, wow, okay. So yeah, I'll see if I can find that for you guys and, yep. and also put it in the description in the show notes. But, you know, it's gone from a, yeah, it's good to, you know, pay off your hex debt to you have to pay off your hex debt. Yeah. And if you don't, it's going to cost you a lot more money. Yeah, and I, I guess to those people, Bahrain being one of them, yep. all in these tax-free zones, Yeah you know, Middle East, the Gulf, part of the GCC com uh, countries, um, it's going to come as actually a bit of a rude shock, to be honest, because if they're on good income yeah. and the ATO wants a 7% 7, 7 repayment, that's, I think, the highest here, or 10%. No, 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 it's up to 10 now. Yeah, so 10% of, say, you know, you're making 300000 and you've still got a fair bit of hex there because, you know, you're a lawyer or whatever, um, that's a rude shock. And the other thing, too, that it causes a lot of confusion, it's 10% of your salary. Not, not, of the hex debt. not of the hex debt. Not of the hex debt. So people go, oh, I've got $50,000 hex debt, but I've got a $200,000 salary. Yeah. They go, oh, 10% at 50, that's fine. Yeah. You know, you're not paying five grand. No, no, not at all. You know, so. Income. Yeah, yeah you're, that's right. you're spot on, actually. I think a few months ago, someone's like, oh, it's only, you know, I've only got this left, so I'm only going to have to pay back, you know, probably 1500 I was like, uh uh, this yeah. year you're paying back the full amount. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, you're spot on on that. That's something that people are not aware of. They don't, and they get caught all the time. And I think, you know, just spending a bit of time get on the front foot yep. putting a bit of money away on a monthly basis yeah that's right that, it's the easiest way to solve it you know roughly you know and we'll also put the thresholds in the um in the show notes in the description as well it's very easy to see roughly where you're going to be yeah 
and yep. you know what your salary is. Yep. So just make a quick calculation. Say, right, I'm going to need to pay back ten thousand dollars this year. Um, divide that by twelve mm. and put that away. Yeah, exactly right. And I mean, one thing people don't understand and realize is that, let's say you do the hex lodgement, the ATO says, listen, we want ten thousand, we want it now. You can actually put yourself on a payment plan where. Yep. If you're using an accountant, that's fine. If you're using the on, online MyGov system, you, they require a minimum of 10% down payment on that, and then you can put yourself on a payment plan over the next few months. Yep. So if it's a case where your cash flow is short at the moment, um, you can always do that. So yep. yeah, don't stress too much, but if you don't pay at all, don't let the ATO know, then it's likely they'll um, put general interest charges on it. That's right. Probably, you know, why not find you at the same time? Yeah. So just all these things in the background that can still go wrong. And those interest charges aren't at the same rate as a mortgage. Not at all. <laughs> They're a lot yeah. higher. <laughs> well, I think they range between 9 and 11%. Yep. Yeah. So, so it's ridiculous. a lot of money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, but um, And that can apply to even land tax and everything like that. Yeah. So anyway, that's, a, that's another fine. No, it is, it is. Um, Anyways, Brett, let's move on to deem disposal. Yep. I mean, it, it's shocking how often I come across an inquiry, a consult, and I mention deem disposal. It's weekly. Oh, almost daily. Well, it is daily. Yeah. And, and the fact that even those people's accounts don't mention it to them, it's almost like the accounts even don't even know about it. And yeah. it's probably because they have, they're not providing advice to internationals very often or expats very often. So yep. why would it be in their repertoire? goes back to episode two when we talked about picking the right advisor and right accountant, someone yeah, who's right. match fit in the industry because Betting. this this stuff is, it's, oh. it's like picking up a rock to us. It's, it's such a, it's, it's I'll, that easy. I'll run you through a hypothetical that yep. I had this week and it's, I feel terrible for the bloke, but it is what it is. So deemed disposal is um, essentially a capital gains tax event that you crystallize when you leave Australia. So hypothetically, if I'm leaving at the start of April and I'm holding a share portfolio, because it only applies to non-taxable Australian property, so that's shares. Managed funds, funds, ETFs, listed investment companies. Spot on. So you can only do it on those type of assets. And essentially what it means is, the day that you leave Australia, you're saying to the ATO, I'm selling these assets. On paper. So on paper. Yep. If, I've, if I'm making a gain, you will have to pay some capital gains tax. If I'm making a capital loss, you'll get the benefit of carrying forward that capital loss. Capital gains, sorry, capital loss. It then means that no further capital gains tax is going to accrue on the growth of that asset. Now, let me paint a picture for you. I work for a tech company here mm -hmm. in Australia. I've been invested thousands of shares over a 10-year period. I leave Australia. I ask my accountant, is there anything I need to do about these shares? Or, you know, the accountant not being experienced in that situation just says, no, no, they'll just keep growing. You don't need to sell them. It's fine, you know. Um, you know, you can look at selling when you're overseas or when you come back, but normal capital gains tax will apply. I then find out seven months later, after my tax return's already been lodged, about deem disposal. Um, the shares have done an IPO. They've yep. gone, obviously, I've, I've, I've done all these, um, I've, sorry, I've had all these rights, so I've executed them. Yep. I've made a huge capital gain. Now, because I didn't do deem disposal on the shares that I was already holding, that capital gain is now taxable. If I sell the portfolio down, it's taxable at non-resident marginal tax rates. Which no tax-free threshold, Nothing. 32 and a half cents in the first dollar. If I want to hold that share portfolio whilst I'm over as a non-resident, I can't even apply the 50% CGT discount method for yep. the period that I hold as a non-resident. If that keeps going up, up to you know several million dollars, that's a huge CGT event that I've got and I can't get out of it. And look, it's, it's amazing how I would say eight out of every 10 people that we meet mm. who have some sort of shares outside of super. Yep. Yep. Haven't heard of this. No. You know, and sometimes you get lucky where they might hold a, a poor performing stock in their portfolio. Yes. Um, that can offset some of the, the CGT that yep. is liable when you do the deemed disposal. Yeah, absolutely. But as a classic case in point, you know, when you own something that's $50 a share, yeah. You know, yes, there's a bit of pain, mm. but if that fifty dollars share goes to two hundred and fifty dollars a share, um, that's all tax free. Absolutely. Now, it could be a potential double bung, and I'll throw the US applications here as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. If you were to sell those shares, you're in tech, so more than likely you'd be in San Fran. Mm -hmm. If you are in San Francisco and you were to sell those shares, not only would you owe the ATO a truckload, oh yeah, but a governor at the California state <laughs> is got to put his hand up for California state tax as well. Yes, absolutely. And that's something you don't want to have to deal with. No. You know, you, you want, okay, yes, 
the you know California state tax their bid, mm. but not on top of the ATO. No. no so no suddenly you've gone from making a great gain to now paying out probably potentially over half yeah. of the yeah, portfolio yeah. Yep. in just in capital gains tax. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, look, a deemed disposal is incredibly important for a lot of people um, because these days it's very common for people to build a, a small investment portfolio, shares, managed funds, ETFs. They're mm. so easy to buy these days. Yep. But they don't realise that if they were just to take the proper time before they moved overseas mm. to sell these on paper, pay the capital gains tax at that point, mm. then, or depending what jurisdiction you're in, um, but from an Australian point of view, you don't owe the ATO any capital gains tax on that on that growth. Not at all. Um, and you know, it's it's a to me, it's it's that side of it. Um, cash is also a big part as well. Yeah. You know, people are nervous about moving cash around. Yeah. And we did have this question, which we'll go into you know towards the end. But yep. you know, it's amazing how either people just don't have a clue, mm. or they've heard ever myths about what may happen to it yeah. and um, yeah, we'll hopefully you know, answer some of those ones down the track as well too. Yeah, exactly right. And just, I mean, just to finish off on the deemed disposal side, you know, if you're doing deemed disposal, yep, great. The shares go up in value. If you're not crystallizing any capital gains events, you're not making a tax event on that portfolio in your other domicile. And then when you come back to Australia, that's when your cost base will essentially reset on those shares. You can still hold on to them. That's great. When you re-enter, usually the closing prices of that day, that'll start form mm. the cost base going forward. And that's how you go about it. Um, but just to be clear, if you've gone overseas and you haven't done deemed disposal, but you've lodged that final tax return, you can't go back and amend that. No. The reason why? Because obviously, you know, you're producing a, a quite a large financial benefit. You're gaining from your in in high, like it's in going back in time, yeah. and you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. The AT, it'll trigger an audit um, yeah. with the ATO, and the ATO will just be like, uh, uh-uh. uh. Yeah. So you can't go back and audit those sort of or amend those sort of things. Um, so sometimes, yeah, obviously seeking advice with someone that's match fit, they've got clients yeah. that are expats, yeah. um, always the way to go. And that, that, is, that is probably question number two that we ask people. Mm. You know, do you have any shares? You know, did you do deemed disposal? Yep. It's actually on our client profile form. Yeah, it is. You're you right. know, simple things like that. It's, it's all these little things, like we said in episodes one and two, the little things done early and right yeah. gives you the best results. The ones that you hear the horror stories of expat stories, are the ones who didn't seek advice yeah. and they've tried to go back in time. Case and example. Yeah. The, the individual I spoke to earlier in the week, he worked for a tech company. Now the portfolio's worth a few million. He can't really sell it. If he sells it, he's going to get absolutely smashed yeah. by capital gains tax. Um, you know, he could look to wind it down over a few years. That's yeah. probably the only way he can go. Yep. Um, but now he's just sort of stuck. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So what do you do? But it, I'll move on. Yeah, um, definitely. Yep. Move on to the next point of it agenda so a self-managed super fund what is it first let's educate people quickly what yeah is look it? i think there's a lot of confusion out there about what an smsf is yep. a self-managed super fund is a fund that not only are you the beneficiary of yes but you're the trustee let's ignore the jargon you're the one pulling the levers yes okay and we're not just talking about investment selection but the actual compliance itself yep. okay. of the SMSF. Yep. So you're sitting there making sure that the investment strategy is up to date. You're making sure the audits are getting done. You're making sure, you know, the biggest problem we find, especially in the last five years, is there's been this rush uh, of people to get SMSFs. They're not sure why. Yeah. Yeah. But they get it. Yeah. And then they don't realise that when they go overseas, mm. the goalposts are in a completely different direction. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's pretty rare that it, you don't know, like. You'll know if you have a self-managed super fund. I mean, you've got to do an annual yeah. tax return like you're, you're running a business almost. Yep. Um, so you know if you have a, a self-managed super fund, but when you leave Australia and you become a non-resident, you really need to be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, and some things that I've come across in the last few weeks about other individuals holding SMSS, uh, I wanted to sort of touch base on it because it is a big issue. So we're going into central management control. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So central management control is essentially... Um, or, the central management control of a self-managed super fund needs to be maintained by a normal Australian tax resident at all times. Now, there is something called rubber stamping. Mm-hmm. A rub- rubber stamping on a self-managed super fund is essentially, I'm a non-resident. I've got a self-managed super fund, yep. but I know about central management control. So I know I'm not allowed to be the one pulling the strings on anymore. I go over and contact my brother. I go, mate, I need to put you on my self-managed super fund. I know it's all my assets. So he becomes the trustee. He becomes a trustee. Yep. Uh, I've got a corporate trustee within it. So, so he, he becomes the director. director. Yep. Um, POAs, everything. So on on the surface, if the ATO looks at him, he's like, oh, no, he's a normal Australian tax resident. That's fine. Yep. This is compliant. Um, but if they go to my brother and say, 
and they ask him questions about SMSF, he doesn't know anything. No. He doesn't know what's going on. Yep. Uh, and that's what we call rubber stamping. And we know that right now the ATO is actually going out to the trustees of self-managed super funds, not just for expats, mm. but everyone in general, Yeah, yeah. to make sure and ensure that they understand what they're doing. Exactly. So if your brother were to get that correspondence from the ATO, what's he going to say? Oh, he wouldn't, know. He wouldn't yeah. know what to say. Yeah. And this is what's happening. Um, there was a case, in, in a case in example, I think it's um, tax determination 5 slash 2018, and it, it made evident about rubber stamping where um, exact same case, uh, SMSF existed. Um, they put on their family members to act as um, obviously, you know, the trustees, the directors, they actually had no idea what was going on with the SMSF. And you could see, still see behind the scenes, they were still pulling the strings, yep. making the decisions. They found email threads to the yeah. accountants yeah. saying doing this. So um, essentially the ATO was lucky in that the ATO gave them one opportunity to wind it up straight away. Um, and it's very rare that a hack happens. Yeah, usually, usually it's like straight Gone. non-compliance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So usually it, it, what happens if they deem it to be non-compliant, uh, you no longer get the tax concessions that a self-managed super fund has. So what that means is your tax rate of 15% is pulled off. They, uh, le- what, sorry, they levy a new tax rate of 47%, and that's on the assets as well as the income. So you essentially lose half your balance yep. straight away. Half balance is gone. Yeah, it's yeah. an expensive exercise. And oh. and I think the important distinction to make is too, is when you're appointing someone, you can't just tell your accountant or your financial planner, okay, you're it. We're yeah. talking about the overarching... Yeah, everything. You know, the hiring and firing of accountants and financial yeah. planners and, yeah. and the whole, you know. And I think the other important distinction too is regarding beneficial ownership inside of SMSFs. Well, this is another thing the ATO looks at as one of its tests. So why would... I be running, or why would my brother be running my SMSF when he has not one dollar in there? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. No, and I think um, that's where a lot of people get caught up. It's like, yeah, listen, uh, so I've taken care of that. I've nominated some other directors and stuff, and it's just like, well, that's just rubber stamping. That's that's yeah. a band aid. Yeah, um, that's you know solving a problem for another problem later in life. Exactly. <laughs> um, and it's usually a case that it, you know, the other problem comes around in twelve months' time. Yeah. Um, just on that though, I want to touch base on the temporary absence rule. Yes, good one. Yep. So, yeah, I think it's the two year rule. Two year rule. SMSS. Yep. So if you're still coming back within a within period two of two years, years um, they say that, listen, okay, we can see that you're only temporary absent, therefore we're happy that central management control is still held by you. Yeah. But what's unusual about temporary absence rule, if on the surface, on the facts, that you, they can see that you're permanently gone, but you've had due to some uh, event overseas you've had to come back but it looks like you're going to be gone forever mm. even if it's under two years they'll say non-compliant non-compliant yeah because we can see based on the facts you were gone yeah, yeah. You, you were severing all ties yeah yeah whereas sometimes it can go the other way oh we can see that you're, you're gone just for over two years but we know that we realise there's an intention to come back yeah you own your property here you weren't ready to get out all those sort of things or your family might have been still in Australia or... exactly right so they say listen we're happy for temporary absence rule to apply here so it's yeah. still you know CMC is okay yep so uh, it's a very fine line, the temporary absence rule, and it just seems like uh, it depends on what kind of mood the ATO is in. And I also think it goes to show, like we were talking about last week in episode two with the Harding case, yes. you know, not every determination will apply to every single person. No. You know, it really comes down to your personal circumstances, mm. and you know, your neighbour could be an Australian as well, Yeah. but just because they got away with it doesn't mean you can. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's under the hood that, you know, really comes into working out whether it's you know relevant or not so yeah and, and as we touch base hopefully the board of taxation comes up with some new residency rules and something easier 183 day rule wouldn't that be a nice oh. uh, little christmas present so yeah yeah absolutely i mean yeah. you, you, you could actually essentially become a non-resident quite easy exactly um but yeah they're not going to make it that easy let's be honest yep no exactly right yeah. exactly right all right brett so that's self-managed super funds non-residency don't do it that's i mean that's my own advice um look it's unless you're holding a physical asset that you know property property yeah you know that makes it very difficult you can't sell a balcony off or those sort of things yeah yeah you know that you know may not be the smartest idea to do that yeah okay. um then you may hold it but still it's not a solution no it's a band-aid yeah exactly right and then i mean if you're intending if you're intending on going away for three plus years you don't you shouldn't have a self-managed super not at all no you, you can't contribute to it while you're a non-resident because yep. that breaches the active members, members test. test yep uh, there's a whole suite of tests but um just don't do it. No. It's not worth it. If that's no. your retirement, losing 47% of it, it's not worth it. Good advice. Yeah. 
Oh, well, Brad, let's move on. I um, I want to touch base on opposition's proposal. Yes, this um, is what uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shorten's talking about in the lead up to the election. Exactly right. So he's mentioned uh, quite a quite a, a lot of things and a laundry list. Oh, it's a laundry list. Yeah. And when I read through them, I um, I was actually quite nervous for expats. Because mm. um, initially we thought. Oh, it shouldn't affect them too much, but when you go through and look at the detail, when you look, look yeah. under the hood, I was like, oh, yeah, sh- you know, yeah. shit. Okay. We've, got, we've got five pages of yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff here, so yeah, exactly right. So, first one I want to touch base on, which we mentioned briefly last week, was the negative gearing. Yep. So, as we know, they're looking to make a change to negative gearing. Um, no idea what date they're going to set. It could be actually retrospectively, so yep. they, they could throw a date back as of the first of January, two thousand nineteen. Um, and essentially, you will no longer be able to use negative gearing on second-hand properties to offset future wage income or anything like that. Um, second-hand properties can go against um, current investment income yep. so from dividends and those sort of things. And if you want the benefit of carrying forward a net income loss, you will need to actually make sure that you buy a brand new or uh, a brand new uh, property. So off the plan, off the plan, yep. exactly right. Which is easy enough to understand, but. When you've got a, a current property portfolio, um, it's there's not too much guidance on how that's going to be treated, and if yeah. you, especially if you've got a, you know a few hundred thousand dollars worth of net income. If there's like income. grandfathering or, that's or right. those sort of things, yeah, that's right. So they've announced that it's quite a scary rule because, as we know, uh, Australians have a love affair with property. Expats just the same. Yep. Um, and I suppose that's where the MREs come from as well. Mm. Um, so um, that's one scary proposal. So what's the scenario? You know. Uh, Fred Smith moves to Dubai in 2020. Yep. These rules are enacted and enforced. Yep. He buys a second-hand property in Balmain. Yep. That is, for all intents and purposes, negative again, e.g. the cash flow is negative. Yeah. With that amount that uh, he's putting in out of his own pocket to top yep. it up, that's money gone. Well, doesn't receive a tax benefit. Um he might get to segregate the net income losses on that property to apply to future investment income okay. only. Yep. But if he's someone that's not interested in doing other investments, he's not going to get the benefit of it at all. Yeah. So ideally, ideally, uh, if you're doing the negative gearing scenario on secondhand property, you either have already another property that's positively geared, yep. or you've got other sources of income. So that, you know whether it be from yeah, other investments, yeah. essentially. But other than that, the, uh, that kind of strategy just doesn't work. No. Nah. So, so virtually we could see a big change in the landscape of the Australian expat community here on that on that benefits of buying a property mm. um, because they'll be paying money out of their own pocket. For no reason. For no reason. Yeah, no reason. Okay. That's, that's as simple as it is. Yep. Um, so I mean the next one that I want to talk about, uh, non-concessional contribution cap. Yes. So at the moment when we contribute to super, two types of uh, caps. We've got concessional, cons- non-concessional? Yep, so concessional when we put it in, 15% contributions tax comes out, it's 25000 a year. Non-concessional, treated as an after-tax contribution, goes in, no tax comes out of it, uh, and at the moment it's 100000 per year. So they're looking at reducing that to 75000 okay. um, per year. and then that They don't want people to put more money into super? No, 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 they want to yeah. tax it. Oh, yeah, no. that's right. Um, so that's, how that's, that's, what, that's what's happening. So it essentially means if you're triggering the bring forward rule, you can only put up to 225000 rather than 300000 So that's, yep. that's actually quite big. Um, especially if you're selling your house and you're wanting to get as much into super before you retire at 65 or whatever it might be. So, bit of an issue there, but um, just something that obviously Labor wants to get in. Yeah. Look, and I think it's a, it's almost like seeing around a corner. You can see the government's focus is to reduce the ability to put money to super. Yeah. So, if you do have plans or are an inkling of topping up your super account, more earlier than later. Yeah. You know, because just to explain a scenario, if the bring forward rule... Essentially, if you buy the age of, of 65 and you're working, you can put in three years worth of yeah. non-concessional contributions in one go. Yep. If they were to change that and your three-year rule straddles mm. um, the change, so let's say, for example, you put in $300,000 on the, on the 1st of July this year, yep. triggering in the next two financial years, yep. but they change the rules as of 1st of August, mm. You've actually been pretty clever, yeah. Because yeah, we have, yeah. So just consider those, you know, those options, people, you know, because it, you know, in a landscape that is changing so quickly, like Canberra is, mm. we don't know what it's going to be in twelve months' time, let alone six. Yeah, well, exactly right, and when, that moves me on to the next point where catch up concessional contributions. So they are the effective as of this financial year. So catch up concessional contributions state that we can accumulate our non-used concessional um, contribution cap. So if I put in 10,000 this year, 
I can carry over 15,000 to the next year. Yep. So that means next year I can put in 40,000. 40,000, yep. Uh, and so on and so forth over a five year rolling period, as long as my superannuation balance is under 500,000. Yep. Now, labor being uh, the fun party that they are, they want to remove it straight away. So as of 1st of July 2019, if they get in, they're actually going to remove that rule, which means if you're saving up this year's concessional contribution for next year, for next year to offset a capital gain on shares, property, whatever it might be, you've just wasted a year that you haven't been able to get anything in for super. Yep. So it's another one. Um, it's another pain point that I think mm-hmm. expats are going to feel because the ability to accrue these concessional contributions over you know five years means that if I haven't done deemed disposal, on a share portfolio and I've got a large capital gain on it, I could sell it down in that final year. Use the proceeds from the sell down of the shares yes. to Offset. contribute as, as a concessional catch up contribution into super. Yes. And then the tax deduction you get from the concessional contribution, you then offset against the capital gain from the shares. Absolutely. And the difference in that is no tax rate threshold for non-residents. Yes. So our effective tax rate is 30 to one half percent. After 90,000, it tears up again to, I think, 37. Yep. Um, so if I'm making a, a capital gain of 125,000, putting that straight into super, I know that's only going to get taxed at 15%, which yep. is amazing. It is, yeah. So that's one thing. That's that's a pain point for expats in the future. Um, it's a scary piece of legislation. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So that's that point. And I suppose the last one, which I think is a huge one, yep. is the removal or the potential removal of personal tax deductible concessional contributions yes so that ties into the last conversation doesn't it it does it comes straight back over so yeah um it essentially means we can't use it to offset a, a capital gain or anything but yeah. a common strategy might be i you know i'm living in dubai i've got two investment properties they're positively geared on the surface they're producing say twenty thousand dollars net income yep um and i can actually look to put that into super as long as i feel like the right forms and i contribute in the right manner and claiming that as a deduction yep Claim as a tax deduction, that's taxed only at fifteen percent. Yes. Compared to thirty two and a half percent. On the twenty. Yep. Saving self seventy and a half percent. Um, just making sure I do it correctly. Because yeah. I've seen people do it and then they can't actually claim because they haven't done yeah, it correctly. Although they've made a non concessional instead of a concessional and That's yeah. right. That's right. So they, they sort of get surprised by like, what do yeah. you mean I can't claim it? Um, so essentially they want to remove that and reinstate the old rule where you almost had to be self employed to be yes. able to do that. So yeah. the ten percent rule um, which I, I think believe uh, stated that you had to have personal services income over 10% yep. to be able to make such a, a contribution. Yes. So it's, the removal of that means that it's almost going to guarantee the expats that have positively geared properties will almost always pay 32.5%. Because they can't claim any deductions. Well, they can't put it in. Yeah. So they can put it in as an after tax contribution, but there's not really a tax benefit there for that year. And you know, why be limited to 25 as a concessional when you put it up to 100? Yeah. As a non-concessional, so yeah, exactly right. So um, that's really scary. Yeah, I think that's huge. Um, and you know, watch this space because we'll wait and see what happens. Well, it's amazing because that law was abolished back in twenty seventeen. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's not even no, dead yet. You know, exactly right. Now they're just flipping yeah. it back over. Yeah. No, we actually like that one. Let's put it back. Yeah. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely wait and see. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty nervous about it to be honest. Yeah, no, no, rightly so. Yeah. Rightly so. Rightio, Brett. Um, that's what I wanted to cover on the agenda today, but I want to move into a few questions now. Definitely. A bit of Q&A. Yep. Um, the first one we had was um, making a, a gain or a capital gain overseas and then sending money back. Well, or... it, was, it was sort of cash assets, yep. you know, moving money around, yep. perceived beneficial gain due to foreign currency exchange. Yep. Um, I guess the first thing I would like to answer this is the massive misnomer that mm. it is illegal to transfer money back to Australia, which is not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's the first one. Yeah. The second one is do not transfer $9,999.99 because it's below the 10000 threshold. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. You're more likely to be flagged at that level than if you're transferring $500,000 back. Yeah. You know, their computers are watching all amounts. Yep. From $1 to $100 million. Yep. If something yep. looks suspicious, they will flag it. Yep. And... You know, and I think it's it's that big brother looking that sort of almost frozen expats into fear. Yeah. They don't want, oh, what should I do? Long story short, and like we're talking about in previous episodes about your behaviours matching that of a resident. Yeah. You know, if you are in Dubai and, you know, would a Dubai resident buy property in Australia? Yes. Yeah. Would a Dubai uh, resident buy shares in Australia? Yes. Yeah. 
So just the fact that you're an Australian citizen that happens to be in Dubai is the same thing. Yeah. So that's probably the first mistruth I'd like to get rid of because time and again we get people who they're sitting on a pool of funds in, in, in an overseas bank account, mm-hmm. which we now know thanks to CRS, yeah. the yeah. ATOs, and they're going to know about it anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, and they're, they're sort of not sure what to do with it. This mm. money's not getting any you know, earnings. There's no yeah. growth. Yeah. Um, but they don't have the comfort to invest in other markets because yeah. they don't understand them. Well, I know Isle of Men. Yeah. That's a common one that a lot of people love using. We, we, we see that every day, unfortunately. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's something that, you know, I know I've talked in the past and, and we might actually do a, a more concrete blog post yeah. about the questions you should ask. Yeah. Because based on the questions that we wrote out in the past, I would hazard a guess to say that probably 80% of offshore financial advisors mm-hmm. would fail this question there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because of all the convoluted um, fees, mm-hmm. you know, opaque structures. Yeah. Um, Time constraint, like the you know, you, list goes. It sounds like you're referring to international bonds of some sort. Uh, could be, yeah. Some sort of international product. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I think that's the that's the big thing. I think that um, you know they sort of steer towards because they hear a, a smooth talking yeah salesman who yeah you know, knows the pain points. But you know, the biggest thing with with cash moving cash around, whether mm. it's from Australia overseas or overseas back to Australia, you know, it depends on where you're domiciled at the time. So let's say, for example. You move overseas, you move some money overseas to fund that lifestyle, not a problem at all. You live overseas, you build up cash, you move back to Australia, you leave that cash over there. Mm-hmm. Now, you've got two problems. A, that cash is now uh, accessible yep. from an ATA point of view. Absolutely. And B, if the currency happened to move in your favour, what would happen? Or well, you'd make a gain, wouldn't you? Exactly. So once again, CGT event. So, Foreign currency gain. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we when, we, when we're talking about uh, expatriation, repatriation with clients, yep. The key thing is always, you know, try and map your movements as with a, as a result. Yeah. As a result, yeah. you know. So if you're in Australia, why would you leave money overseas? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You know, and and you know, I think that's the biggest concern that people have about. They sort of almost get frozen by fear that they leave stuff there mm. when an actual fact creates a problem. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's a great thing to have to pay tax because it means it made money. Yeah, yeah. But if you can avoid it, yeah, even better. And I mean, I suppose that. Um, moves on to you know when you're repatriating try and come back in a clean manner you know mm. not leaving assets and bits and pieces trying to do it all within I suppose or before trying to get that money back to Australia setting yourself up or you know if it's regarding an overseas foreign super fund you know the six month yep. rule all those sort of things but yeah so there is no issues around if I'm in Dubai I and I'm a non-resident I can send back yeah, you know, of course you can. back to Australia yeah. I'm not going to get hit with some exit tax that I no, don't know about. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think we, we've seen in the case in the past where people have had their salaries paid back to Australia. That is, an, that is a no-no. That's suspicious. Yeah. And I definitely wouldn't because yeah. it's just, you, you, well, like you Would said. Would a Dubai resident have their salary paid into Australia? No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. Yeah. Exactly. They'd have a local bank account. So, yeah. And I suppose that's one area that is hard for those uh, type of seconded employees which are in those unstable yeah. uh, financial... They may not have want to have a bank account in their country. Yeah. And we saw that case with um, the Saudi engineer seven years ago. Mm. You know, he didn't have a Saudi bank account because of the problems in Saudi. So yeah. his salary was paid into an Australian account. Yeah. Exactly. And look at the problems. He won the case, but look at the problems it created, it created. him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thousands, thousands. Because that's, that's how we jumped on the radar with the ATO because yeah. I saw this monthly and it actually had salary yeah, yeah. written on it. So, yeah, exactly. you know, they've gone, well, Clearly, you're an Australian resident because yeah. your salary is getting paid into Australia. So yeah, it's a big no-no. Okay, big no-no. But you know, long story short, you know, when it comes to moving money around, if it is perceived to be doing it for a gain, then don't because mm. you will get taxed on it. Yep. Um, you know, I've found expats in the past almost like to collect bank accounts like stamps in a passport. Yep. You know, one client bragged to me once he had nine bank accounts oh, in about seven countries. I think it was or six countries. Um, I hope so wasn't, I hope he wasn't a US tax president. Well, he well. wasn't, but uh, you know, as I said to him, I said, "What's the reasons for keeping all these bank accounts?" And yeah. he's like, "Well, it's a bit of fun, you know. If people want to move back there, the account's up and going." And I said, "Do you mind telling me what uh, fees you pay? Because expat oh. bank accounts are quite high on yeah. the annual fees." Yeah, they are. And I think we worked out by closing down. Uh, he wanted to keep four, which I said, "Okay, that's fair yeah. enough." By closing down the remainder, I think we saved something like five hundred dollars a month. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just by doing that. Yeah, so, and ridiculous. let's just say that exercise wasn't easy closing those accounts in either. No, it wouldn't be. So, when you're um, in other countries. It is. So, just yeah. yeah, when you when you're managing your money, act like a local is probably the best way to describe it. Yep. You know, you can certainly invest. There's no problems at all about investing, but make sure behaviors act in the same sort of way. Yep. Okay. No, that's pretty straightforward then. 
Um, moving on to the next question. This is actually about one of, uh, I suppose, the services we offer about the pre-departure review. Yes. Now, I've had um, a client ask, is that beneficial doing it even if I'm already living overseas? And is, as a checkup is in, have I missed anything? Like, obviously, it will allude you to the fact that, yeah, you potentially have probably missed something. Have you got this? Have you done that with it? Yeah. Um, so I, I've gone back and said, yes, it's, regardless, it is always beneficial, even if you're, you've been overseas for a year, two years. Yeah, it is. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly right. And, you know, the government does a very poor job in outlining what an expat has to take into account. Yes. So unless you're talking to someone like ourselves, more than often than not, you might Google some stuff and you might get one, two, three points. But you may miss five others. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, right. And uh, you know, the great one is with, if you've got hex help or TSL debt. Yeah. You have seven days from the day that you moved to that country to notify the ATO of your new address. Yeah, ATO wants to know. Yep. Okay. And most people are too busy unpacking suitcases and everything oh, to do that. Last so, thing you think about. You know, yeah. so that's one big one with with the hex side. The other one is, you know, the insurance conversation side. Super. Mm-hmm. People, most people don't know they've got it there. Yeah. And they'll just keep paying for insurance that may or may not be valid. Yeah, exactly right. So, yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, it's always a, it's not expensive. Look, it's $295, but you get the benefit of everything that we've been able to build and absorb our, our library of knowledge, you know, over the space of close to eight years mm. in a very, you know, personalized, customized report yeah, exactly. that you can look and go, great, okay, I'm done. And yeah. you just, it's, it's more about buying peace of mind yeah. than buying an answer. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, no, exactly right. Okay, well, I mean, so yes, I mean, it's clearly beneficial. Yes. Okay. Second question. This is more of something that would be targeted towards an accountant. Yep. Um, I might feel this question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so tax audit insurance. Or, okay, yep. And it's something that a lot of accounting firms offer. Yes. And it essentially covers you and covers that accounting firm um, for the cost of going through an audit with the ATO. Yep. Now, a lot of accountants, um, they usually offer it for businesses, companies, mm-hmm. self-management funds, all those ones. It's it's rare that you'll find them offering it for individuals, yeah, but, but it does exist yep. for individuals. Um, it's going to range anywhere between fifty to three hundred thirty dollars for an individual. Yep. But that's what it's it's buying that peace of mind that in the event you get ordered, okay, that accountant that you use can go and lodge a claim on this. Um, therefore, that's going to help cover soliciting costs, um, time and efforts, and their costs for going through and preparing all the relevant documents for the audit. So that's what audit insurance is. Uh, yes, it can be beneficial. If you've got a lot of bits and pieces that you left back in Australia and you know you want to make sure if you do get ordered, you're safe, yeah. you're good, yeah. then you know, if your accountant offers it, absolutely. You know, it's worth opting into. So if you had an expat overseas, the ATO challenges their non residency. Oh, great example. Would that would that cover it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's essentially it's trigger an audit. Um, yep. they wanna know they're gonna obviously look at your residency details, um, and therefore your current account that you use that you've bought that insurance through will go and launch a claim on the audit insurance. Yep. And then it's likely that the, the obviously the provider will pay out um, an amount to help cover soliciting costs, obviously yep. all the relevant um, tax prepar- preparation as well as relevant documents for that case. Yep. So it is beneficial. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have it, you're you're the one that's going to have to pay the accounting firm. Pay Which is very expensive. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I'd hate to see. Especially what if that... solicitors get involved. And, well, yeah. I imagine the fees that uh, the Mr. Harding case. Yeah, he'd be six figures. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he'll be paying that down now over the next few years. Yeah. So, yes, it's worth it. Always, you know, you've just got to ask your accountant if they offer it. So there's a tip, guys. Audit insurance. Have a chat to your accountant to see if they offer it. And if they do, grab it with both hands. Absolutely. That's all I've got on today's agenda. Okay. So those few questions and those yep. few other things. So look, I think that's you know a good uh, probably place to wrap it up. We mm-hmm. could go on for hours and an end, but you know as you've seen, there's a lot of different topics that we're going to try and bring into this, um, and a lot of them are layman's questions that we see on a daily basis from everyone. So yeah, exactly right. You know, yeah. um, from James and I, just want to say thank you very much for for dialing in and. Uh, don't forget to either uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, give us some feedback and also review us on the podcast as well and, and make sure you subscribe as well because, um, you know, being a, I don't know what I'm saying, um, uh, a vanity person, but mm-hmm. when we see those numbers go up, mm. it's, it's amazing how we go, okay, let's do some more. Yeah, exactly. So we want to do this as much as possible and it's great affirmation from our point of view when we see those numbers coming in, mm. I think, wait a minute. Yeah, let's do some more. So keep it up, guys. We're loving the feedback. We're loving the commentary. Um, You have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Speak to you soon. Thank you.